That's not a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Comic Reviews. I'm Sid Part 2 and I am very sorry for being very late. Um, it was a big week and I had something else I had to get done tonight that took up about an hour and a half of my time. So, my apologies, but hey, here I am. I'm live. Uh, I don't know how many of you even watch live, so this might be like just completely pointless to the people that watch after the fact. Anyway, I'm going to get started pretty much right off the bat, but not with the reviews. There are a couple things I want to talk about first. Um, so today is the 11th, and on next Saturday, not the 14th, but the 21st, Comic Book Club will be reuniting again, and I want to remind people that we'll be talking about Volume 1 of Fables, which is called Legends in Exile. So please, uh, if you have a copy of that, or if you can get a hold of it by the 21st, please feel free to join us. Uh, this is the deluxe edition. You don't have to get this. There are cheaper versions. That's just the first volume called Legends in Exile. So yeah, if you can get a hold of um, a copy of Legends in Exile, you are welcome to join us on the comic book club. All it requires is a microphone and headphones, access to the internet, obviously, a webcam is preferred, and a legal copy of the book we are reviewing. Um, a bit of reverb, huh? Oh, I don't know how to really fix that, necessarily. Huh. One moment, please, as I search for headphones to hear what I'm sounding like. That's uh, all the way in the other room. <laughs> do I have myself muted? No, I do not have myself muted. Maybe if I plug in my headphone jack, that'll help. Um, myself on the program. Oh, I do not fine. have myself muted. Maybe if I plug in my headphone jack, that'll help. Um myself on the program oh, I do not have myself muted maybe if I plug in my headphone is that better let me know if that helps for some reason I think the headphones affect the uh, the sound so before I continue I'm gonna get confirmation from the live audience uh, sorry folks watching after the fact timestamps in the description if you want to skip all this noise the loop should end in a second. When I listen to myself, uh, it it cuts back in. Yeah, it's good now. Uh, since Lo is the one that pointed it out, hi Lo, by the way. Uh, I'll I'll wait till I get confirmation from her if that's fine with all of you. Again, sorry about this. The these are the problems that you encounter when broadcasting live. I will remember to keep my my headphones here. <sighs> Just talking. Till I hear back from Lo that... Okay, thank you, Lo. Anyway, as I was saying, yeah, we'll be talking about uh, Fables Volume 1 Legends in Exile in the next comic book um, club episode, so please get a hold of that. Uh, I'd love to, to have some of you there. Lo, you're in the chat. This is Fairy Tales, and I think that's kind of in your realm of cool fantasy stuff that you like, so maybe you could be there. Who knows? Anyway, uh, yeah, that's the first announcement. The second is more of a current event thing, and I don't really talk about all this stuff very often, but it is worth noting. Um, you may have heard in the news about Stan Lee going through a lot of financial trouble and um, having to deal with a lot of just crises in his life uh, and people trying to take advantage of him and, and rob him of money. And obviously I'm, I'm sympathetic to that because no one deserves that, no matter what they've done. And for those that don't know, Stan Lee does have a very sordid past of, of kind of messing with his collaborators. That being said, like, he still doesn't deserve what's happening to him, but I've seen a lot of people, like, outpouring with, um, kind of a, a, you know, w wanting to help, wanting to, to be there for him and help him out, um, and I just wanted to talk about this because I did a bit of a, a Twitter rant, and I do think this is something worth talking about that people should know about. And I, I want to make an announcement of something I'm going to start doing, and I want to encourage you, my viewers, to start doing as well. All 1,400 via. I know I don't have the biggest audience, but anyway. Um, so Stanley, I think he's going to be fine, all things considered. He's in 
he's working in Disney's like one of their most profitable franchises. They'll understand it'll be bad PR if the dude is starving on the street. So I think Stanley will be taken care of by his friends and his corporate allies. Um, but there are tons of comic book writers and artists going back decades to the beginning of the medium who have been completely screwed by industry and do not have those same resources. And I want to inform you guys, if you don't know, about a charity that exists called the Hero Initiative. And this is a charity that exists just to basically take the place of royalties that these guys and, and girls uh, deserve, but they never got the credit for, they never got the payout for. So, like, if you're a comic book fan and you read comics and you love comics and these characters that have been going for, for decades and decades... Um, then I, I highly recommend donating to the Hero Initiative because this just helps those guys, you know, with, like, either big life-threatening things, like if they get sick, because, of course, comic book writers don't get, you know, company-mandated insurance. Uh, they're mostly freelancers. Comic book writers and artists don't get that. Um, so if you're, you know, if these guys are sick or, or need surgery, or if they're just, you know, struggling on fixed income and need that extra little bit of money to help, you know, bridge the gap month to month. So I'm going to start doing this, and, and I hope to encourage you guys to as well. Donate what you can to the Hero Initiative whenever you can, but I'm going to start donating every Wednesday the equivalent to the most expensive book I bought. I'm going to just consider the Hero Initiative like another book that I'm buying. Um... I donated $15 last night while I was doing this this whole speech, and I, I understand it's in a lot of money, and that kind of just shows you every little bit helps, so I, I highly recommend donating to the Hero Initiative. So, you know, nights where I have a $4 book is my most expensive issue, uh, that's what I'm going to donate. Nights where I have a $3 book, that's what I'm going to donate, so on and so forth. $8 book, that's what I'm going to donate. Um, and I just want to encourage you guys to do that as well, uh, because, you know, these... These creators really did help the industry form, and they got completely screwed over in it, and they deserve a kickback. Uh, so, you know, look up the Hero Initiative. You can just Google that. It's the first charity that's going to pop up. Um, they they do some good work. I've been really impressed with the, the stories I've heard from them, and I want to start giving back to, to some of those guys for creating something that I enjoy so much, and I encourage you to do it as well. Uh, if you can match a book that you buy every week, or if you got the funds, matching your poll list, the price of your poll for the week would be, I think, a fantastic way to show support to the uh, the founders of the industry, as it were. It's a charity that shouldn't have to exist, but I'm glad that it does. All right. Now that announcements and stuff are out of the way, I want to get into what we'll be talking about this week, because I do actually have a pretty big week. So we'll be starting off with Sonic the Hedgehog number two, then Exiles number one, followed by Captain America number 700, Darth Vader number 14, Trinity number 21, Wonder Woman number 44, and we'll be closing off the night with Trade Talk by talking about JLA Volume 2, American Dreams. This is Grant Morrison's second volume on Justice League. So, plenty of stuff to talk about tonight. I just realized I left the door open. I'm going to close that, and we're going to get right into it. We're going to get right into it, I say, as I spend the first ten minutes of the video not getting right into it. <sighs> Alright. So, let's do it. Sonic the Hedgehog, number two, uh, by IDW Comics. Um, I, I, I'm I not going to have a lot to say about this. I am going to say the exact same thing I said last week. It's fun action, cool art, uh, you know, cool character interactions um, with the Sonic, you know, mainstays. That is this book. Sonic shows up to a town that's about to be attacked by a giant mechanical spider. He defeats the giant mechanical spider almost entirely. But then just as it's about to come back to life and 
bite him in the ass. Amy shows up, destroys the giant mechanical spider. Turns out it was all a ruse to distract from a invasion that's coming in from the south part of the town. And so Sonic and Amy have to work together to help the townsfolk not be attacked by robots. And the whole time, Amy is arguing with Sonic about how he needs to come back to the Resistance so they can start to rebuild properly after the defeat of the Eggman Empire. But Sonic doesn't want to do that because he's Sonic. Now, an a interesting thing that I've found in these two issues so far, and it looks like it's going to be the trend, is a, a team-up move, like a, a special team-up combo kind of thing, since we're talking video games, um, with these two characters. In the, in the first issue, which I actually have right here, um, you have this moment where Tails and Sonic... Well, look there, open right to it. Tails and Sonic do like a team spin dash. It looks right out of Sonic 4. Um, you have that, and then in this issue, they call it the Croquet Special, where Sonic rolls up into a ball and Amy uh, hits him with her mallet toward the ship, like a giant croquet ball. That was cool. That was cool. I, I like that. I'm... I, I don't have much to say. Like, that's just a neat little idea of, of how they operate as a team, stuff like that. Um, the anime influence is definitely there in the art, which is fine, because Sonic, you know, comes partly out of Japan. Um, so that's kind of cool to see the anime slash manga influence and, and whatnot. I'm enjoying... I'm just enjoying the way that the art is portraying everything. It's just cool. It's fun. Uh, like, I really like this panel of Sonic and Amy. Um, something about that just really works for me as they're just taking down, uh, robots. Whee! Isn't this fun? Oh, yeah. Like, that's, that's cool. I just, I enjoy that panel. I enjoy a lot of the art. Um, you know, it's, there's not much to say about this. This is fun. It's, it's just kind of your typical all-ages cool action comic that takes two minutes to read. Uh, the preview for next week has me very excited since I really like Knuckles. I'm curious how many characters they're going to go through here. I know they did the, the covers that we can expect, so I guess next week is, um, Blaze the Cat, and I don't even know who that character is. Uh, I'll be honest, I was kind of hoping for Silver or Shadow. Um... I got a thing for, for Silver and Shadow the Hedgehog, not gonna lie, so that would have been cool to see them show up instead. But, hey, Knuckles, I'm excited for Knuckles. That's fun. That's cool. Fun book. Uh, if you like Sonic, get it. If you don't like Sonic, you're probably not gonna get it anyway, even if I told you to. So, you know, whatever. Uh, if you got, like, little brother or something, little, little nephew or niece that likes Sonic or, or really likes Amy the Hedgehog or whatever... And get it for them. Just just throwing this idea out there. Ah. Nate Snyder says, I found out that IDW's Transformers stuff is ending. Aw, oh, man, still had a good run. Eh, that's too bad. I don't read Transformers, so I don't know. All right, let's go ahead and move on to Exiles, number one. Um, so when I was going through my poll list at the comic shop, and this came up, I was like, what is this? And then I looked at the title, I'm like, oh yeah, Exiles. I remember saying that I wanted that, and to put it on my pull list. But why? Why did I put this on my pull list? Like, I'm looking at the cover, I'm like, do I recognize anyone? This, this looks like Valkyrie from Thor Ragnarok, but like... That's just not my jam. Like, I, I know a lot of people are in love with her, and that's that's cool and all, but, like, she was just fine for me. I didn't really care for her one way or the other that much in the movie. But, like, I'm like, why did I add this to my list? So I had to look through Twitter to figure out why. This is the book that's going to have Peggy Carter caps in America. Which, in my mind, is the best selling point you could have possibly had in this book. And she's not popping up till issue two. And that's kind of emblematic of, of kind of my thoughts on this. Of like, 
all right, this is a cool idea, and I'm, I guess I'm interested enough to see where it's going to go, but, like, just whatever. It's, it's pretty clunky. Um, it's your pretty clunky, typical universe stuff, uh, I hate to tell you. Okay, and this is stupid, though. This part is unbelievably stupid. So here's the cover, where you can see Blink, who is a mutant, and all the other characters that are going to be popping up. So you got kind of like an Iron Man-looking guy, and you got like this older lady looking, but she's got this very distinct t-shirt. Uh, obviously she's, um, a Valkyrie inspired by Thor Ragnarok, and then you have like kind of a cartoonish Wolverine down here. So you can kind of guess at, at who everybody's going to be. Literally the first page. Why? Why would you bother? <laughs> What is the point of that? <laughs> That's really stupid. I'm sorry. Like, not even getting into the... That kind of imagery is really stupid. Um, it's already there. You can already guess at who everyone's gonna be. That's dumb. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, like, this is just really clunky, though. There's, there's no getting around that. We start off with just, like, pages of exposition um yeah it's it's this far into the book before we get like into the meat of the story and we're just explaining what the the MacGuffin's gonna be um so you've got this dude who's stuck on the moon being forced to just watch his former earth uh and just not be able to do anything about it kind of like a watcher but in prison um, and he used to be White Nick Fury. <laughs> okay. But then, White Nick Fury appears on the moon in front of him and drops this object before he dies, I guess. Okay. Meanwhile, old dude's talking about how he's watching entire universes and alternate realities in the Marvel multiverse be consumed. Everyone say hi to Haley in the background. Um, and as he's watching these, these multiple Earths being consumed, <laughs> being consumed, um, and so then we get to Blink, who is a mutant that transports, teleports between multiverses and stuff, and she feels a pull to the moon and goes to the moon and discovers the phallus, which is really hard not to just call it phallus, but whatever. Discovers the phallus and gets told she's got to be on a mission to save the multiverse and she's chosen because she's more cavalier and, and willing to actually save the multiverse as opposed to sit on the sidelines and just, that's a lot of stuff happening and just, god damn, that's a lot of exposition to just load you down with. Um, so it just feels really clunky. But then the story starts going. And Blink ends up in kind of like a post-apocalyptic wasteland, and she's immediately attacked by some inhumans, and then she wakes up and is being um, questioned by an older Kamala Khan, who I don't know anything about. I don't read Miss Marvel. Um, but yeah, she's she is an older Miss Marvel uh, who is leading a resistance of inhumans that don't think twice about shooting mutants, which I didn't even know that mutants and humans hated each other. Um, and then her universe ends just as the questioning's getting started, and her and Blink are taken out of the universe by the Thallus, and then they end up in a future reality, and this is where Iron Lad shows up, and Iron Lad goes through his origin, which he is the past version of Kang the Conqueror, and it's just... This is a lot. This is like just Exposition City. This book should not be called Exiles. It should be called Expositioners. Um, like, I, I'm i kind of down. I like the, the look of Blink. I, I kind of like the way she's written her attitude. But, man, this is just so much. This is so much information that I just do not need at all. 
like, oh, how to put this? I want to like your characters. I like the idea of getting the, the whole multiverse teams together. That's fun. And I want to enjoy those characterizations. I could not give a shit as to why they're teaming up. I, I could not give a shit if it was a universe, multiverse ending event, or if Exile, or if uh, uh, Blink just got bored and just wanted to hang out with some cool alternate reality versions of other characters. I probably would have liked the better the, the latter one more. Um, man, this is just a lot. And again, the reason I bought this book, or wanted to buy this book, and the reason I feel like most people would want to buy this book is for Agent Peggy Carter as Captain America, right? Like, just, you, you hear that, you see the promotional image they released of her, that's cool. And for that not to even be on the cover as the major selling point, or at the very least to have that be the, the like, cliffhanger image of, like, you know, they're in trouble and, and Carter Cap comes in to save the day, um, you know, that, that would have been a great cliffhanger ending that's not the cliffhanger ending we get. Um, what is the cliffhanger ending? See, I've already forgotten, to be honest. Oh, yeah, the cliffhanger ending is the Time Eater shows up, and he looks kind of like Galactus. I'm assuming he's probably, like, going to be Galactus's time twin or something. Um, so, Exiles, number one, I'm really not feeling. Like, I like the general premise, and I'm hoping once it gets going and, like, gets the team together, it might be fun. But, like, I didn't even talk about how much of the exposition is still here. Because, like, we get, we get Blink's reason for going on this, this quest and, and rounding up the team and stuff. And she's kind of, like, being bounced around um, with, without really knowing where she's going to pop up. The, the Thallus is moving her around. And she gets there and she has to explain it to Kamala Khan. Um, and then they get bounced to the future. And they have to establish they're in the future. And they have to introduce themselves to Iron Lad. And Iron Lad has to explain who he is. And they have to explain to Iron Lad, Iron Lad what they're doing and why they need him to join their team and save the multiverse. So, like, we get the explanation that the multiverse is in danger, like, three fucking times. Uh, or, no, four times. Because, like, the, the exposition Nick Fury explains it to us the reader then he explains it to blink then blink explains it to kamala khan then kamala khan explains it kamala khan and blink together explain it to iron lad that's too fucking much that is way too much that is sloppy writing unfortunately and i'm sorry i feel like i'm really just ripping into this book and i don't mean to because i think it was just it's just kind of like you know fun dumb comic writing um, that you can really do what the fuck ever with. It's just exhausting to read and, and try to have any complex thought about. Again, I, I kind of like the characterization, and that's probably the most important part on a team book. Um, but I can't help but feel like just... Maybe I'll give you the, the first section of just Exposition City of Nick Fury explaining it to Blink and, and Blink... Uh, having to go on the mission. The rest of this really could have been handled in just a montage of getting the team together and then the time meter showing up and, like, Peggy Carter Cap could have been the, the one to come in and, and say, here's the plan. Um, that's just an... Immediately, it's an infinitely better book um, that is not, you know, the expositioners. Um... So, unfortunately, I did not care for this very much. I wanted to, but the reason I bought it hasn't happened yet. So, I'm staying on until at the very least we get to Agent Peggy Carter. Or, you know, Cap Carter. Uh, Captain Carter? Yeah, Captain Carter just rolls off the tongue a bit better. Um, but, man, if unless there is just a marked improvement... Um, by the time we get the team assembled, I cannot, I cannot sit here and do this. So, here's hoping. Uh. Alright, let's go ahead and move on to Captain America number 700. 
All right. So when we last left Cap in the bad alternate future, he had just deposed uh, not Donald Trump from being the the lure the um, undisputed ruler of America, uh, and now the the people had decided that Cap must lead them into a brave new world, which was a really interesting premise to put on Cap's shoulders in the aftermath of Secret Empire. When people blindly trusted Captain America to make the right decisions as, you know, undisputed ruler. Um, and so, it seems like they were going to go somewhere really interesting with that. And they really don't. They just don't. Like, this this opens up with, you know, what seems like it's going to be a discussion about trying to kill Cap because he's he's gone power mad or something. And then we see that Cap is defending the borders of America from hostile forces like Russia and, and Latveria and stuff as every army tries to stake a claim and, and take the land um, and caps, you know, using duct tape and string to hold an army together and, and try to, you know, save the country and bring it back. Um, and so that part's really interesting. But then the, the coup, the assassination, just is not at all what's what's going down. Um, it's Bruce Banner and Lee, the, uh, the leader of the resistance until Cap showed up, um, discussing the idea of, of sending Captain America back in time to, to stop this post-apocalyptic future. Uh, and he says no, and he keeps pushing to try to, you know, salvage the country for a year, but then New York blows up in an atom bomb and he doesn't know what to do. He's... He uh, has this moment that I think is really interesting and worth talking about, but I'm not quite sure what to make of this. Uh, so he's, he's talking to Bruce, um, and he says, I don't know how to stop. I never did. So we're winning battles, but we're losing the war. Send me back. You sure? Hope is not a plan. And Bruce Banner says, that's the least Captain America thing I've ever heard. We're outgunned on every front, and I'm out of miracles. It's that simple. And at this stage, it's either give up or accept Banner's Hail, Ma Hail Mary. And you don't know how to give up. And I don't know how to give up. Mm. Captain America saying, hope is not a plan. Um, I'm winning the battles, but I'm losing the war. I like that. I honestly do. And again, it's kind of hard not to just relate this to real world political commentary, right? With with Cap defeating the evil monarch that has installed himself uh, as absolute unquestioned ruler of the United States and has um, has beaten the downtrodden and told them they're not worth anything, they're all pathetic, uh, that the, the strong rule over the weak, uh, you know, I, I like, I like the, the political commentary here, and the idea of hope is not a plan, um, is an interesting notion in the aftermath of President Obama leaving us with a, uh, very divided left, um, that, that led in part to the election of Donald Trump. Um, you know, hope, change, we can believe in hope uh, for the future. Well, hope is not a plan. But there's this point that comes up later as Cap has gone back in time to um, to fight and, and change the timeline and yada, yada, yada. And he says, um, internal monologue... Uh, as he goes to stop a nuclear missile from launching. Um, I don't know how to stop. I never did. Hope is not a plan. But you sure as hell can't win without it. Um, that I really like. But there's this problem that exists when you try to do such a direct political commentary. And this is, oddly enough, the same exact problem 
that existed in Spencer's run, with him trying to do this very direct political commentary to real life. It's fine to do it, but your solution has to have some kind of applicable um, nature to it to real life. So, you know, Cap is in the aftermath of the destruction that a tyrant has brought to the United States. And he is trying to put the pieces back together, but things are have just gone too wrong, and there's not uh, there's not anything he can do to to put the ship back together. So he decides to time travel back to the past. Now, if we apply that directly, quite literally, to the um, the notion of Donald Trump being president. Once we kick Trump out of the White House, we can't time travel back to 2016 and like or 2015 and keep him from becoming president. You know that's just not an action that that is possible, right? Um, I mean, I would love for time travel to exist. I'd fucking use the shit out of that just just for useless shit. Like, oh, I forgot my keys this day. Not anymore. Or oh, I was two minutes late clocking into work. Not anymore. Uh, you know, shit like that. So, this is just, like, it's a really weird thing directly. But let's let's assume that Mark Wade's not suggesting that we time travel to to stop uh, the, the effects Trump has had on the country. Because obviously he's exaggerating the effects. Bad as Trump is, he has not caused a nuclear apocalypse. Yet. Um, so, if he's exaggerating the effects of you know, this this uh, fascistic rule, then he's obviously exaggerating the, the means needed taken for a solution. So what's the, what is the, the solution to be gleaned from this? That we go back to, um, to the way things were before Trump? I, I guess, but like, that's clearly not perfect. Um... I don't know, like, there's, that's just really weird. I'm willing to give this another read and see if, if things connect a bit better. I think the arc on the whole might, might add up a bit better. But as is, I don't know, something, like, you're about to reboot the universe fucking again, Marvel, anyway. Anyway, I'd be fine with Cap having to be in the future and just deal with the shambles. Um... Just trying, like, old man Cap, just trying to put the future back together. I'd be fine with that. I think that's interesting, but that's not what we did. We we send him back in time. He saves the day, but dies in a nuclear explosion. And the version of himself that got sent to the future was encased in ice, but was able to break out because of the effects of the explosion. So it's it's a, a self-sealing time loop, is, is the argument, like... Cap was frozen, so he could go to the future, and then come back in time to save the day, thus not sending himself to the future in the first place, so it closes that time loop. Um, I guess. It's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit weak. Uh, I, he mentions that he's talking about an alternate timeline. I'm like, eh, it's, it's kind of shit, but whatever. Um, so anyway... Cap meets Lee, uh, even though the, the time doesn't really, uh, timelines don't really add up because Cap was like 20 something years in the, or not even 20, like five to 10 years in the future. Um, so that's, yeah, it's whatever. Uh, and then there's this really interesting thing and I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent on this. So Take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt, because this is a backup for the 700th issue. But it's called The Gauntlet, and it is story by Mark Wade, based on material by Stanley and Jack Kirby. Classic artwork by Jack Kirby and Frank Garcia. Guys, Geosia? Uh, I don't know. So Mark Wade has written a story 
based on old images of Jack Kirby drawn Captain America comics, and they've been, I'm assuming, photoshopped and compiled together to be consistent. So maybe people actually know what what's going on here, and I'm I'm just unaware, or maybe something else ha is happening that I don't get. But I'm pretty sure that's what happened. I'm pretty sure this is either not all from the same story or is compiled um, from different stories. Uh, Jake Carlson says, unpublished Kirby Cap colored now. So this is an unpublished unpub story that like Mark Wade's gone back and added just the, the plot structure to by just adding basically the words and, and making the whole thing flow together in a narrative. Um... I don't know. It's it's an interesting idea. Uh, I don't really know what's been done with it because certain things about this feel like they could be f really from any Cap uh, Jack Kirby comic. Like this this whole page feels like it could be um, pieced together from multiple books. Uh, so I don't know. This is it was interesting. It was cool to see Jack Kirby's work you know, redisplayed in this new way, uh, the modern, the mo more modern techniques on the coloring was also kind of cool. I've been really curious to see if someone would go back and find, um, uh, find, you know, Jack Kirby just pencils without any inks and do like modern inking and coloring techniques on them, like digital coloring and all that. It could be really neat. Uh, Jake's also saying, I know Jack... I know Kirby's pages were unpublished, so it's probably from one comic, and so that that leads me to believe that that Wade's kind of compiling the whole thing together to to put a story around the the um, tale. Uh, so all right, well, this is just an okay issue. Uh, Coates will be writing um, Captain America with the new Marvel series i don't even know what we're calling it yet can i just call it marvel reaper <laughs> i don't know uh so we'll see what happens with that i don't know i'm curious i've liked wade's run well enough though i think he's got one more issue in him or something um oh marvel fresh start is what it's being called okay fine marvel rebirth's a better name and you know it captain america 701 Promised land. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, oh, really? We're going until 7.04? All right. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. Fuck it. We'll keep going. We'll keep doing this. All right. Let's go ahead and go on. What are Marvel books tonight? Uh, as we talk about Darth Vader number 14. Um, so if you watch the newest series that I'm doing, I'm doing another monthly series for those that missed it, uh, for the, I'm trying to bring back the monthly comic, comic roundup. Um, so I, I put Darth Vader, I believe it was number 13 on my honorable mentions. And that was because I was just happy with the, um, the direction that issue was headed in how it felt more you know plot driven and and like you know it had more of that driving kind of spy feel um and i just i wanted to see more of that so ian did this issue do more of that It's definitely more in that wheelhouse than it is like a video game, but then there's some useless shit that like, I'm sorry, you just, you don't need. Like, fucking serious, dude. The Jedi explains the, the, the purge, Order 66. A Jedi that survived Order 66 explains the purge to his pupils. Who the fuck does Charles Soule think is reading this book? I'm sorry, if you've not seen the Star Wars movies, your ass is not going to be reading a Darth Vader comic. 
If you've not seen the prequels, your ass definitely is not going to be reading this Darth Vader comic. You know what the fuck happened. Why would you need to, to spend, like, three pages on exposition about who Anakin Skywalker was and what he did? That's dumb. <laughs> um, that is filler. Uh, I really don't like that. Um, that's just, that is a waste of my pages. I would like, let's see here, the issue cost $3.99, and we spend one, two, three, four, we spend about four pages dealing with the history of Anakin Skywalker. Let me, uh, let me pull up the old calculator here, uh, uh. Where's my keyboard at? I got a, got a calculator shortcut on my keyboard. It's quite nice if it's in range. I need to get my keyboard in range. Ah, range, range, keyboard in range. There we go. All right, so let's see here. How many pages does my comic book have? <laughs> One, well, average comic has what, 24, 22 pages? I'm gonna go with 22. Let's just say 22 pages, all right? 22, or well, no, hold on. I need to do, uh, all, right, all right, so here we go. Here's the math, here's the math. 3.99 divided by 22 pages equals about 18 cents a page times four equals 72 cents. Charles Soule, I'm going to round up. Charles Soule, I want 72 cents back on this comic because that was a waste of paper. Uh, that was seriously... I don't know what you're writing at that point. The rest of the issue was fine, but I was very distracted by someone explaining Order 66 in a Star Wars comic that's like been entirely about the post-Revenge of the Sith timeline. Um, I thought that was, that was pretty stupid. Oh, uh, let's see, what are the live comments saying? Um, Jenner Devil just shrugs from hearing that title. Uh, all right, let's see. Let me ask something. Is the Kieran Gillen run of Darth Vader good, whether, whether or not I'm a fan or of Star Wars? Uh, I think the Kieran Gillen and Darth Vader run is amazing. I think that is a very good run and much better than what Charles Soule is doing, unfortunately. But if, would I enjoy it if I wasn't a fan of Star Wars? Maybe I have a harder time answering that um, because a lot of what that book does is it bridges the the gap in characterization between Vader and Episode Four versus Episode Five. So that I'd have a harder time telling you. It's definitely not like super accessible. Um, let's see here. I feel it's cold to not need to see the prequels to know what happens. Uh, I feel it's cool to not need to see the prequels to know what happens. I mean, all you need from the prequels is both Clone Wars cartoons. That'd be interesting if there was retelling of the prequels. I want a retelling of the new trilogy. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I feel like if you're reading this book, you've seen the fucking prequels. And if you don't, you know what happened. Otherwise, there's no reason to be reading this. Uh, this does not... This is by no means marketable to people who have not seen the prequels. Or at the very least seen Revenge of the Sith. Or at the very least... Know that Anakin Skywalker is fucking Darth Vader and he was a Jedi that fell to the dark side. Like, I, I'm sorry. With, with the fucking Inquisitors being in here, there's no reason that you don't know this. Um, so that is incredibly distracting. That being said, the rest of the issue I quite liked. Uh, so I'm going I'm to start off with the bad here. I'm having a good time tonight. I hope you guys are. I'm going to start off with the bad here, but to go into the good. So, Mon Calama, or Mon Cala, uh, which is the home of Admiral Akbar and General Radis, um, uh, the, is, is being invaded by the Empire because of this convoy attack and, and high tensions. And so, um, Vader is sure that the king will not leave the palace while his people are being evacuated. And we get a cool little flashback to the Clone Wars. Shout out for Ahsoka being there. That was pretty cool. Um, and Vader is so sure, and he says, Lee Shar will not abandon his city, this city. And then we cut to the war room, and we got... It's kind of cool to see 
you know, what will one day be Admiral Akbar and General Radis in the same room together. That's that is a little cool fan service moment that that really feels appropriate. Um, and so they're advising the king of what to do, and Tar and the king's trying to negotiate with Tarkin, tell him to withdraw his troops, and Tarkin's like, "No, your people attacked us, so either you're un incapable of controlling your people, in which case the empire needs to step in." Or you're in open rebellion against the Empire. Um, and so, like, that just kind of goes to shit real quick. Negotiation is out. Um, then we get the, the stuff with the Jedi, which, again, was pretty stupid. Uh, I don't remember the name of this Jedi. I, I got enough Star Wars fans. Someone name this Jedi, because that's, that's who is uh, advising the Mon Calamari. Um, anyway. So... The king uh, says, I had two options um, for what to do. The people have evacuated the cities, and the nonviolent option has failed. So uh, it's time for the second. Um, and the king is then attacked by Vader and the Inquisitors before we can see what the second option was. But then... In the middle of the attack and tried to uh, attempted forced interrogation, we figure out what the second option was, which is fucking gigantic ass whales, like city sized whales. Causing tsunamis to destroy what little uh, surface settlements there are. That's fucking great. Um, one of the things I really liked about the Clone Wars show was the um, the way that it actually showed proper Star Wars, like how to how a war would tactically be fought in space and and dealing with invading planets of of various types of geography. And so this was really cool. That was just a great idea that, all right, so we have a planet that's almost entirely water-based with very few land, land settlements. And just, just how do you deal with, with an invasion of that planet if you're the defenders of that planet? How do you deal with, you know, you're a... a aqua-based species, you can survive underwater indefinitely. Um, you don't need surface. The surface is just a convenience for people visiting your planet. Um, how do you deal with people invading your planet that are surface dwellers? Don't give them any fucking land to stand on, literally. That's really cool. That is the kind of stuff I really like. Um, so I'll give Soul... Credit where it's due. The meat of the book is pretty great. The exposition for <laughs> Order 66 is pretty useless. Uh, like, it's it's got an excuse as to why it's happening in the issue, but it is needless. If I were Soul's editor, I would have told him to cut the scene. It's so unnecessary, and you could have done more with the interrogation of the king. That could have taken up just as many pages and been just as interest and been much more interesting and, and fit with the the themes of this issue. Um, so anyway, their settlement's gone. Doesn't look like Tarkin had any knowledge this kind of thing would happen. Um, and Vader seems to be lost in the abyss. Uh unknown whether or not he will survive of course he will he's got more movies to be in cover for it next issue looks pretty cool uh so yeah i i quite liked the majority of this but i got i can't lie that was that was a pretty rough opening <laughs> or not even opening that was a pretty rough little bit of exposition that just was so unnecessary <laughs> oh man How's everyone doing? Comments good? <laughs> I 
Good one, Akuma Ranger. Appreciate that. All right. Two more issues to go. Two more issues to go. Let's go ahead and go on to Trinity number 21. This book was fucking confusing. Um, you know, you don't get... the the. Oh, I'm as guilty as anyone. When I do this show, I mostly talk about the stories. Like, I just talked about that whole Darth Vader book. I didn't mention the art once. Uh, the art was good in that, by the way. But I'm just as guilty as anyone. When I talk comics, I tend to go story. Because I don't know a ton about art and, and structure and, and how things are drawn. There are things that happen that just completely go past my head that I don't even think about. Um... And so you don't really notice when the subtle parts of comic books, not even talking about the the visualization of the art, the rendering of the characters, you don't notice when the invisible parts go right because they're doing their job. But you definitely notice when they go wrong. And Trinity is a pretty good example of the visual side of the storytelling going wrong. Because I've been pretty sour on Trinity by Robinson. Uh, you know, I bought this book from Manipal, and he's not doing it anymore. And so I'm kind of sour on Robinson. Um, but I do believe that he's, like, trying his best. And unfortunately, I just I just don't quite know what he's doing. And it's weird, because some, some of the panel structure is really cool here. And just the way things are laid out and told. Like, this is a cool uh, double-page spread. Definitely knows how to do those. But then things start to happen that are just super confusing. Uh, so we get we get this sequence as the you know, the Trinity is about to enter the big ominous building. Get a panel of them all in new costumes, and then we get a flashback panel of them all in the, the tattered up costumes. And they're back in Sakaris. And they're talking with people. And then we get a page turn. And they're still in Sakaris. And they're talking with people. And then... Batman goes over to talk to the sorceress. And you go to the next page. At the top. And suddenly there are guys shooting. At you. And then you realize they're shooting at the Trinity by the bottom of the page. What? Batman was talking with the sorceress. What's happening? What's happening on this page? Turns out, this page is in the past. This page is in the future. How can you tell? Well, Batman's got a tattered up cape on this page, but not on this page. Why is that a problem? Because he's in the bottom panel right here, and you don't see him again to the bottom panel and off to the side right here. So this is just confusing as shit. And this continues throughout the rest of the fucking issue, and it's just bizarre. Turn the page. Batman continues to talk with the sorceress. And everyone else is having carrying on conversations on Sakaar. The next page, back to the present as they break into a vault. Um What? I'm so I don't know what's happening. <laughs> this is so head scratching. Uh Next page, they have entered the vault and are talking. Next page, Batman has entered a vault area-like thing with the sorceress and is talking. Bottom of this page, we cut back to the present in just this panel. And then on the next page, we're back in the present. But not till this panel, we're back in the past. What are you doing? This is not a, a matter of like the artist did a poor job laying it out or something. This is a matter of the script for where to put the panel and, and how these things were going to jump was terribly thought out. Because it is, it is just confusing. Uh, I just, I don't even know how much sense I made trying to explain the sequence of time jumps. But this was just bad uh i'm sorry i i feel like i've been just so shitty to people tonight but this is just the definition of how you do not structure a comic book um 
It feels like I'm reading a fucking Nolan film, and that is not a compliment. Uh, this is confusing as shit. And it, it just kept going. It just kept going. And, and I'm like, what is happening in this issue? Ugh, it's, it's not good. It is not a good issue. Uh, I, you know, there's that old adage Stan Lee had of every comic book is somebody's first comic book. I hope this isn't it. I hope this is no one's first comic book because this is just confusing. There's no other word for it. Uh, that was a pretty bad issue. No lie. All right. Last issue of the night is Robinson again with Wonder Woman. Uh, number 44. Amazon's attacked. So I, I've been pretty sour on this book as well since Robinson hopped on. Uh, I'm not a fan. Um, but I quite liked the way that the last issue ended with, uh, with... You know, Darkseid having this plan to gather artifacts and try to steal more artifacts from Argus and creating a boom tube. And you think, okay, Darkseid's going to show up and, and his army is going to fight Argus and they're going to steal the artifacts. No, he stole the fucking floor of the building with the boom tube and teleported it to where he was so they'd be completely disoriented and, and everything. Um, That was pretty good. I like that. That's a pretty cool, clever, awesome comic book plan. Um, and what's weird, since I was just talking about in Trinity with Robinson doing a very poor job structuring, this issue has pretty good panel structure. I really like this opening page. Um, this is solid. You know, the Amazon jungle. Boom! Moments ago. And you just get like, there's the structure, there's the boom. There's the collapsed Argus building, like you even have the sign saying Argus. I like that the secret military facility has a sign that identifies what they are, but uh, that's that's pretty funny. So, you know, like this is a, a example of strong structuring. Um, and, you know, this is cool. Wonder Woman punching Darkseid right on the first page. You can't complain about that. Uh... It's really convoluted, and, and it's pretty much just big action fight issue. Everyone's, like, swooping in, fighting, and, and yelling at each other, and Wonder Woman's trying to fight Darkseid, and, and Darkseid's saying, you have no chance against me because you, you could never beat me with help. What makes you think you could beat me on your own? Uh, and then the, the Furies are fighting Steve Trevor's soldiers, and, and meanwhile, Darkseid's minions are putting together this this thing with the stuff they stole from Argus. Grail's a distraction, yada, 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 yada. But there's a portal opened to Themyscira, and Grail goes through it. Wonder Woman tries to go through it, but is rejected, because, to quote Grail, um, The gods do not permit those who've left Themyscira to return. It's true. But the relics in this gauntlet we reverse-engineered from them, from new gods of old, old lore, old power, have enough connection to the ancient energy of your island of paradise that it can be reached, breached by me, at least. A half-Amazon, who, for the brief time I was there as a baby, was held in my mother's arms. I never actually set foot on it until now talk about a fucking loophole <laughs> like what the shit kind of contract is that your mom never set your ass down like 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 she laid you in a crib and that doesn't count god damn that's specific as hell shit <laughs> oh man so I just find that really funny. It's not necessarily good or bad. But anyway, Grail teleports to Themyscira. The Amazon Seer and like, who the fuck are you? And she's like, doesn't matter, bitches. Z zap! Your servant's of dark side now. And then we got Cliffhanger for the next issue. I, okay, whatever. I don't care. This issue is nowhere near as bad as the Trinity issue. Um, I, I don't think James Robinson is bringing his A-game. Uh, at least I hope not, because neither of these are particularly good. 
Um, but it was fine. It was it was pretty dumb, typical comic book kind of stuff. Uh, and I, I, I do like the art a lot more in this uh, over Trinity. The art in this is just cooler. You know, this is this is pretty. I like that. I don't know how much I like Dark Side Bleeding, especially if it's red blood, but I do like this. Here's a here's a quick little question for the uh, the YouTube commenters. What color should Dark Side's blood be? You can leave your comment after the fact. I'm curious what the live audience has to say. And it gives me a second to take some drinks. Ooh, Jake Carlson says white. I like that. Or black. Or orange. Uh, Dr. Holocron just says dark. Jake Carlson, you can't just name every color. <laughs> Philip Kelton wants rainbow blood. <laughs> I don't know. I like the idea of white blood for some reason. That's really weird. Uh, he should have blood, says Connor Nielsen. Thank you, Connor, for an eloquent and really detailed reply or did you mean mean to say he shouldn't have blood uh i don't know if i how i feel about that one what if instead of like instead of blood he just like bled lava that'd be fucking weird jake carlson says the question is what color is it before oxygen hits it no no that's not the question your blood is red your blood is always red it's not blue before it turn hits oxygen and turns red. No, it's always red. Your blood is always red. But Ian, your veins in your hand, they're bluish, so that means your blood must be blue. No, no. If that's the case, why the fuck is your blood red when they use a syringe? A syringe better not have oxygen in it, otherwise you're fucking dead. <laughs> uh, his blood should be water. Lava. Thank you, Akuma Ranger. I like the lava. Wait, it most must be a color that's outside of the gamma that human can see. What if his rocky skin just flaked off? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Some ideas. Uh, so yeah, the art in this is is pretty cool. But that's about the best I can really say for it. The the art, the panel structuring is pretty good. The story is so forgettable, and that's just disappointing because. Rebirth has been kicking ass for so many characters. It's disappointing that Wonder Woman's not one of them. Um, so, that's just kind of where I'm at. It's pretty bad when the best thing about your book's just the art. That's that's never a good sign. That's, that's spawn territory right there. You guys will have to give me a minute and go do something real quick before I go on to trade talk. So if you're watching this after the fact and you're annoyed that I'm leaving the room, timestamps in the description. <laughs> Let's see here. What do people say in the live comments? Um, puppies. Dark side bleeds. Sad puppies. <laughs> <laughs> Truly the most evil being in the universe. <laughs> That's a good one, Philip. Thank you. Uh, Shout out Batman says, Flash and Wonder Woman are the only books I hear are bad from what I've heard so far. Um, yeah, I've heard stuff about Flash, too. That's disappointing. Uh... Okay, now that Ian's gone, let's all talk bad about him. Good luck with that. 
months. <laughs> uh, again, you should start Flash with issue 45. That's where Flash War starts. Um, I mean, I don't see why not. Anyone else be interested to hear me talk about Flash, even, you know, good or bad? I mean, I'm down. I can do whatever. I'll go back to check your live comments in response to that, so leave them anytime you feel like. I'm going to go ahead and go to full screen now, so I'm not seeing the comments as I go on to talk about this for a trade talk. <laughs> All right. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Trade Talk. Oh, let me let me restart that. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Trade Talk. This week I'm talking about JLA American Dreams. This is volume two of Grant Morrison's Justice League run. As you can see, it's also a, another very thin volume, which is surprising. Um, so this is the the book that I always misremember what it is, uh, and that's partly because it's probably the most forgettable part of Grant Morrison's run. A lot of the other stuff I remember quite clearly. Like, I remember the Shaggy Man, and I remember the... the um, I remember, of course, Rock of Ages, the Injustice League. I remember all that stuff. Um, American Dreams, I can never remember what's happening in here, aside from a few random things. So let me find what is still my favorite part about this book. Uh, and I think is is pretty cool. Um, oh, there it was. Damn it! One more page back. One more page back. Where the fuck? Did, there we go. Okay. Tomare lands on a dying planet. The ring has brought someone to him, and he gives the ring. To Kal El of Krypton. So even when Grant Morrison is at his most forgettable and like just what's going on in this, he blows it out of the park with shit like that. <laughs> That's just too cool. Um, so I'm gonna go through this. There are basically three stories contained within this, if I'm remembering correctly, because there's there's Woman of Tomorrow, then there's the um, Oh, what is it? The the stuff with the angels, uh, and then there's the stuff with the um, with the dreams, imaginary stories. Um, okay, Woman of Tomorrow is an interesting one shot where the league is opening up recruitment and a bunch of heroes that we've heard of uh, and and know of um, start to join or attempt to join, but the League settles on the so-called Woman of Tomorrow, who is new to the superhero community, but really she um, she passes all their tests and, and does just a great job, so they immediately introduce her to the team. And it's interesting how this issue is kind of bookmarked because it more or less begins with Superman attending Metamorpho's funeral. Metamorpho, who of course died saving the the previous Justice League during the attack from Hyperclan in the last volume. Um, but then the League does its recruitment thing and it adds Woman of Tomorrow to the team. Um, and she has, unfortunately, a nefarious origin wherein she's been created by two of the DC Universe's most evil scientists. Dr. Ivo and Dr. Morrow, who uh, Dr. Morrow, of course, created the Red Tornado and Dr. Or Red Tornado for the purposes of evil, but Tornado turned good, and Dr. Ivo, who, of course, created the Amazo robot. Um, so she's been created by them as a trap to destroy the Justice League, uh, but then when she has her opportunity to do so, she realizes something about herself, that she is fundamentally bad, that there's something very wrong with her. And she's not even programmed with the word freedom, but she still sacrifices her life to save not only the team, but people of the city. And so she is 
a um, sentient being. And throughout the entire issue, the uh, two doctors have been arguing over who was the more brilliant uh, since they co-created her, who did the more brilliant job uh, working on her, whose uh, true genius was shown. And Dr. Ivo says he wins because even though he did not program her to think freely for herself, she developed sentience on her own, say, m making him the true creator of the most advanced artificial intelligence. I kind of dig that. That's that's fun. Um, so, like, I'd completely forgotten about that issue. Uh, it's, it was completely out of my head. Um, so the next story arc's called Angels Among Us, I guess? Fire in the Sky? He has, like, a bunch of different titles. Uh, this is where Grant Morrison starts to get some of his weirdest shit. Uh, where we have an angel, literally an angel, crash down to Earth uh, because he was kicked out of heaven. And so things just start to get weird as other angels don't like him that that have, are planning their own coup of heaven show up to try to kill him off because he is a threat to that. And the League stands with the uh, the expelled angel and, and helps save the day. Yada, 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 yada. Uh, there's a big fight. It's all really weird stuff. It's just the Justice League literally taking on the forces of heaven, which is kind of crazy. Um, I don't know. I can, I can really dig all the super mythology stuff. I know some people probably wouldn't like that, but I thought it was pretty cool. Um... To, to just see all this weird crap happening. There's also a pretty cool moment for Superman. I, I didn't mention this, but this is the point at which Superman goes 90s electric blue Superman, um, which is probably in the top 10 worst costumes ever. Like, it's not, like, a bad idea for a superhero. It's just a bad idea for Superman, right? Um, so anyways... Superman now has new electricity powers, and during this whole heaven on earth thing, the moon is being pulled down to the earth, and so Superman has to figure something out, and he um, generates giant magnetic fields using equipment from the watchtower and his new electricity powers to create poles on the moon so it repels itself from the earth and cannot be dragged to the earth. That was pretty good. That was pretty fucking cool. I gotta dig that. Uh, Wally West is here. And he has a whole thing he does as he, he explains everything Superman did, which is pretty neat. Uh, he, he kind of explains the whole situation. I really like that. Um, where was that? Or is it not in this volume? No, it's gotta be in this volume. Uh... Because I really liked it. It was pretty cool, one of the things he says about Superman. Um, mm, he's the only one with yellow dialogue balloons. You think I'd be able to find this faster? Okay. The Justice League teleport device bends space using pulsed beams of some something called ambient matter. Ambient matter exists, blah, 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 blah. Um... And later when it's all over, I ask Superman how he managed to do what he did. And I know that the moon's gravity makes him six times more Superman there than on Earth, but he smiles, and it's that one smile he has, the one that reminds you he's not really from here. There were larger forces at work today, Wally, he says. Go figure. So I don't know. I like that. I like that everyone kind of looks up to Superman. That was kind of cool. Um... There's also other stuff in this that I just thought was really, really cool. Like, as as they're fighting ships from heaven, uh, Wonder Woman goes to crash through, and the, um, the angel that's on their side says, Wonder Woman, hey, remember that? She touches the ship. Ah! I was about to say, remember the touch of heaven burns all mortal flesh. Sorry. And she's just like, burns heal. Watch my back as she goes into the ship to, to start fighting. That was cool as shit. I gotta love that. Grant Morrison does know how to write Wonder Woman. Um, Kyle gets to pull a lot of cool-ass shit. 
Uh, the Green Lantern ring is one of the few things that are working against the Angels here, which makes me question what the hell uh, Judeo-Christian God is in the DC Universe at this point then. Uh, keep it in mind the DC Universe's creation begins with the sight of a hand. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh... Also, I like I like the the Flash Green Lantern team up that begins to happen as Kyle starts to use the ring in really really cool ways. Uh, so this is a cool moment. Okay, is that bit there going to translate what I do on the treadmill into sound? Uh, so he's created. I, I really like the way this is designed too. He's created a giant hamster wheel for the Flash to run in, and it's got tuning forks on the side. So the Flash is going to put all this energy into it, and the energy is going to be transmitted as sound to try to cancel out the vibrational frequency of the angels so they can't exist on Earth at that moment. That's awesome! <laughs> I really like that. Grant Morrison has a lot of fun playing with the idea of what you can do with the Green Lantern ring. And, you know, Green Lantern and Martian Manhunter... Let's see, Green Lantern, and Martian Manhunter, and Aquaman are the characters Morrison hasn't done an extensive amount of work on individually he's done uh batman run he did all-star superman he did wonder woman earth one those are all brilliant he did flash back with uh mark millar in the like early 2000s or maybe it was the late 90s he hasn't done anything extensive with green lantern and he hasn't done anything extensive with aquaman or martian manhunter um i really want him to do something extensive with green lantern because he does some cool shit uh like there's this other moment where they're they're fighting off the angels um, just at first, and Kyle pulls some really cool shit with a construct that I quite like. Uh, it's like a really passive but awesome-ass use of constructs, uh, which I really like. So one of the angels is coming at him, and Kyle puts a, kind of like a, oh, I don't even know what you'd call that. Ah, come on, Claire. Kind of like it just Iron Maiden kind of suit of armor around the guy that he can't escape. Bondage suit, maybe. Uh, and I just love this little dialogue balloon that he has. If I can imagine a cage that absorbs all the energy of his efforts to escape and converts it to sound there. So this guy's like locked in a suit that acts as a cage and every little struggle he does gets con takes that kinetic energy, converts it into sound, and so the more he struggles, the more he hurts himself trying to escape because he's just blaring in his own eardrums. That's awesome. That is so cool. I love the use of that. That's that's really brilliant stuff, Grant Morrison. Um, Grant Morrison knows how to write everyone, so I really want him to do some solo work on Green Lantern. But probably not meant to be, at least not for a while. Uh, so anyways, the, the vibrational frequency plan that Wally came up with in concert with, uh, with Green Lantern um, comes together and it expels the angels and the day is saved. But the um, angel that was with them, uh, teamed up with them, decides that he doesn't have the, uh, the time to stay with the Justice League, even though they, they do offer him that. Uh, and then there's the Keymaster Saga, and this is like, kind of, this is built up and, and set up in the, the Angel arc, but it's kind of its own thing. Um, and so he has knocked out all of the Justice League and put them in machines to create realities. And I really, really like these realities that he creates because Grant Morrison has a lot of fun just creating worlds. So that's where you get the idea that Superman was going to be the Green Lantern of Krypton if he had stayed there. Um, that's really cool. We have Aquaman um, kind of living on this, uh, you know, drowned Earth, and there's nothing left of society, and he's just, like, helping the, the remnants of humanity uh, escape the Black Manta's tyrannical rule. And, and survive through that. That was pretty cool. We get um, Tim Drake as Batman with uh, Bruce Jr. as Robin and Selina as Mrs. Batman. 
that's a pretty cool little alternate reality. So, so the key master has put all the members of the Justice League into these little mind prisons. And I love his explanation for why. And I got to find that real quick. Um, my psychochemicals have begun to open all the locked doors in my head. I'm tapping the 90% of the brain we never use. That's a myth. It's bullshit. Um, and it's given me such wonderful ideas. I've finally done it. The Justice League are mine. Their thoughts belong to the key. And with their help, I shall open the doors onto a new universe. Um, so that's his plan, but I, I, I like his reasoning for the plan. i got to find that. Uh, la, 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 la. It's, it takes me a minute. I wish I should do more stuff marking. I'm sorry, guys. Uh... But <sighs> soon they'll be ready to do my work and hand me the keys to all of creation. Villains monologue a lot. Okay, so the keys got like this whole um, origin. He's an old Justice League vision ver villain. All right, now here's this thing. They always win, you see, the Justice League. They always win. That was the key to it. Of course, it wasn't that simple when I started. He goes through his whole origin. <laughs> um, the Justice League always wins, so I had to make them win for me. I had to turn my problem into a solution. I created the world's first programmable psychovirus, a kind of dream flu, which takes over the central nervous system and produces structured hallucinations. No door is closed to me now. I walk through their teleporters. I paralyze them all with a wide beam neural shock. And then, recently, I discovered negative space and I realized that what might happen if I projected myself into it. Uh, problem number two, my mind, unbound as it is, lacks the necessary power to crack open the negative space doorway. So I thought, why not steal energy from these super minds to do boost my own? I douse them with the virus and tap them in curious and trap them in curious little dream realities. And I'm waiting. I'm waiting for them to realize they're dreaming. I'm waiting for that inevitable Justice League victory because the accompanying psychoelectric surge will give me the means to take control of everything. I so love this idea that that this villain knows the Justice League always win. So he's created a scenario where the Justice League winning and, and discovering the trap that they're in will give him the power he needs to do what he really wants to do. That's so, like, it's, it's such a fucking box within a box, man. That's genius shit. I love that. That's my crack right there. And that's why Grant Morrison's one of the best writers working in comics. You know, Superman's too strong. He's too hard to write. Fuck that. I'm gonna make him stronger. Also, Superman. Best Superman story I've made. The Justice League are just too powerful. They're always gonna win when you have that many characters there. There's no point in writing them. Fuck that. I'm gonna create a villain who wants them to win. Bam. Greatest story ever. It's just it's just part of my, my run. It's the most forgettable part of my run. Grant Morrison's amazing, guys. I love Grant Morrison. Uh, so it's just it's also just really cool to see these little little realities that um, Grant Morrison makes for these guys because it's just such a rich detail world that you're just getting a snippet of. So you know he wrote a whole story. It feels like he has this whole Wonder Woman story planned out where she doesn't have her powers. This feels like a continuation of like mod era Wonder Woman if she never got her powers back or something. <laughs> but here's Wonder Woman in this bomb ass dress kicking the shit out of his uh, Nazi zombie. With Steve Trevor there, kind of looking like Indiana Jones. Trevor, I need help here. These Nazi zombies refuse to listen to reason. I have the answer here, Diana. Look, they're afraid of the clockwise Buddhist swastika, a symbol of life. Now we can return them to the wheel of life and death with the help of our secret weapon. These erosion maggots will devour necrotic tissue, nature's own defense against monsters like these undead Nazis. In Hera's name, what does Von Gunther want? What can be worth all of this horror? This is the temple of No, the primal she-god, Diana. 
It contained treasures beyond worth. No treasure can be worth so many lives. Just, just, just it's so like richly detailed and and clever and fun, and it feels like a comic book I've read, right? It just feels so so uniquely comic book. Yeah, it's Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor fighting the evil Baroness. I don't know. That's fun, and, and it's just all over the place like that. Kal-El as the Green Lantern of Krypton trying to save his er or trying to save his version of Earth. Um It's just cool, man. It's just really fun, enjoyable stories. Uh this is where Connor Hawk also gets on the Justice League because he has the luck to have teleported onto the watchtower um while the rest of the crew had been out. And he was coming in for his audition. Um, but his arrows are immediately taken out. And so he has to use the the backup uh, original Green Arrow. Um, original Oliver Queen arrows. The, you know, kooky uh, trick arrows like the boxing glove arrow. To try to save the day. And so he's just sneaking around on the watchtower trying to save everybody. Uh, Flash also gets a really interesting... Um, little dream reality where he's always the fastest man alive but every day at an exact at exactly the same time he's not because everybody else picks up to light speed and he has to keep everyone from you know running into each other and and all the chaos he has to save the city every day like that it's just cool it's just cool um lots of fun stuff like that uh, where's the, the panel of the Joker? Old Joker was really cool to look at. That was just a fun image. Uh, so just tons of cool shit. This is why Grant Morrison's such a good writer. He can just throw ideas away, and it's some of the most brilliant, fun things you could think to do in comics. I love it. Uh, they, they end up defeating, uh, the key at the end, of course. That's not really a surprise to anyone. How they do it, Connor Hawk hitting him in the face... With the boxing glove arrow is pretty cool. Uh, just as he's about to get his ultimate uh, reward, he just gets clumped right in the fucking face with the boxing glove arrow. And so he gets uh, a seat at the Justice League table. That's pretty cool. I liked it. It was fun. It was solid. Um, Batman, of course, saying that we were taken by surprise. They used a hypnotic attack. We keep falling victim to that. Um, solid, fun. I, I love this stuff. This is, it's just good. It's just fun. It's just good, you know? You just know when things are done well. And this is one of those things. Um, so not a ton else to say. Howard Porter's art is still very 90s. Uh, there's just no denying that. <sighs> like, look at this. Look at Guy Gardner's warrior. Oh, God, that's like sentient 90s-ness. Um... And then just other stuff. You know, it's it's pretty typical 90s uh, art, which if you like that kind of thing, it'll be fine. If you don't, I don't know, you'll get over it. You'll manage. Uh, this, is, this is just what we did. This was a thing that happened. Uh, I like the way he draws Kyle's constructs. He puts a lot of detail into Kyle's constructs, which is really fun. Like this phone booth that he uses to call... Superman at the Watchtower. I think that's pretty fun. Um, so a lot of stuff like that. Again, I also like the uh, the tuning fork device that uh, he had Flash make. Um, or Green Lantern. Flash hat Green Lantern make. Uh, this is probably the best image in the book as Superman used his new electricity powers to give the moon magnetic um, poles. I thought that was pretty cool. So, plenty of good, plenty of good. It's Grant Morrison. Why don't you already own it? All right, that'll do it for this episode of Trade Talk. So, thanks very much for watching, everyone. Bye. Let's see here. What's going on in the live comments? Uh, uh, let's see here. Nathan Snyder says, yeah, I should get Flash starting at 45. 
Uh, Collins is on art for the first Flash War issue and Porter the rest. I'm buying it for the art. Um, let's see. There's a lot of talk about Scott Collins. Um, Shadow Batman was talking about the Grant Morrison book. Zuriel was the name of the angel. And yes, he is much better suited to the team than either of the Hawk people. I'd agree with you there. Um, Shadow Batman also says, this is where Kyle really impressed me on the power set. Um, yeah, I, I think Morrison uses the Green Lantern ring a lot more cleverly than a lot of people do. Um Morrison on Green Lantern. Which Green Lantern would you want him to write? Oh, that's a hard one? I want him to do an alien. I don't want it to be one of the human Green Lanterns. If Grant Morrison were going to write um, Green Lantern for like a solo limited series or, or original graphic novel or something, I wouldn't want it to be any of the human Green Lanterns. And I probably wouldn't even want it to be any of the, the big-name alien Green Lanterns we've heard of. Like, I wouldn't want a, a Sinestro um, story or anything like that. I'd, I'd be perfectly fine with Grant Morrison creating his own alien Green Lantern from scratch and just telling a story with him. Um, that'd be pretty sweet. Uh, that, that way he could do whatever the fuck he felt like, and it would just be really clever. Um, he wouldn't have to worry about the character's history or anything like that. That'd be fun. That being said, it might be interesting to see how he juxtaposed them with other DC Earth superheroes. So maybe it could be, or should be a human. Um, if it were to be, uh, John Stewart. John Stewart doesn't have enough good comic stories from what I've been able to find. I've never, never really cared for John Stewart in the comics, unfortunately, which is really sad because, of course, I love him in the Justice League cartoon. Um, so yeah, that'd be that'd be nice, but we'll see. Uh, he would do the Blind Green Lantern that Alan Moore created. No, I did the Blind Green Lantern that Alan Moore created. Speaking of which, we're making progress on that. I've felt bad about how long that's taken to get together, but we are making progress. Hope to have a, a more official announcement for the cast and crew leaders sometime next week. Because um, I feel Grant Morrison has an issue with more. Yeah, maybe. Uh, more creative Mogo. Let's let's have Grant Lord Morrison do a, a Mogo story as opposed to um, Rotlop fan. All right. I think that's going to do it for comic reviews, though. Uh as I said, everybody, um, if you have a copy of Fables Legends in Exile, Fables Volume 1 Legends in Exile, you can uh, join us for the comic book club on uh, Saturday the 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, all you need is a legal copy of Fables Volume 1 Legends in Exile, a microphone, headphones, and a webcam is preferred. Uh, so please join us for that. That'll be a, a fun little discussion time to, to have with everybody. Hope to see you there. Otherwise, see you next time on Comic Reviews. Bye.